The ocean, a breathtaking yet perilous expanse, is home to many creatures that pose risks to humans. Beyond the infamous great white sharks, numerous marine animals can inflict serious harm when provoked. This captivating video delves into gripping tales of human encounters with these formidable sea dwellers, revealing the hidden dangers beneath the waves. In the contemporary fishing community of Koshega, Alaska, the sea remained a source of livelihood and a constant threat. The men and women who worked these waters respected the ocean's power. Still, they relied on its bounty to sustain their families. It was a life of hard work and uncertainty, where each trip could bring either fortune or disaster. The first sign of trouble came quietly, almost unnoticed. A fishing boat failed to return one evening. The Coast Guard was alerted and a search was initiated. They found the boat adrift, its crew of four missing. The vessel showed signs of damage, as if it had been struck by something large and powerful. The community mourned the loss, but accidents were not uncommon in these dangerous waters, so they forgot about them quickly. However, it happened again. Another boat was found wrecked, its crew of three missing and later found dead. The pattern became impossible to ignore as more boats were discovered and destroyed, and their crews were gone. When the number of fishermen killed was counted, it was up to 17 in just three months. This sent waves of fear and grief through Koshega. Theories and rumors spread like wildfire. Some blamed rogue waves, others spoke of a curse, while a few whispered about a monstrous sea creature. Desperation grew, and the local authorities and Coast Guard could not provide answers. The town needed help, someone who could decipher the mystery behind the tragedies. Enter Dr. Claire Roberts, a renowned marine biologist specializing in oceanography and sea creatures' behavior. Her arrival in Koshiga was met with both hope and skepticism. Claire's reputation preceded her. She was known for her deep understanding of marine life and ability to solve complex ecological problems. Claire's first task was to examine the boat's wreckage. The damage was unlike anything she had ever seen. The hulls were torn apart, splintered by immense force. Her initial hypothesis pointed to a rogue wave or an underwater seismic event. Still, the regularity and specificity of the attacks suggested a more deliberate perpetrator. Her suspicions were confirmed when she examined some of the bodies. The injuries were consistent with those inflicted by a large marine predator. Deep gashes and bite marks indicated the presence of a powerful jaw and sharp teeth. The pattern of the wounds and the sheer strength required to inflict such damage narrowed the list of suspects. It pointed unmistakably to an orca. Orcas, known as killer whales, were apex predators and brilliant creatures. They were known to exhibit complex behaviors and could hunt in packs. However, attacks on humans were exceedingly rare. Orcas typically avoided human interaction and had never been known to target fishing boats so systematically. Claire faced a baffling anomaly, an orca driven by an unknown rage singling out fishermen and their vessels. Claire set out to gather more data. She equipped a research vessel with underwater cameras and acoustic equipment, hoping to capture evidence of the rogue orca's behavior. She spent days on the water, scouring the coastline and monitoring the movements of marine life. Her efforts were initially fruitless. The sea seemed to hold its secrets tightly, offering no clues. Then, one foggy morning, Claire's patience was rewarded. The cameras picked up movement beneath the surface, a large shadow gliding silently through the depths. The footage was grainy but unmistakably showed an orca, its black and white markings distinctive even in the murky water. Claire's heart raced as she reviewed the footage. This was no ordinary orca. Its behavior was erratic and aggressive. It circled the research vessel, ramming it with alarming force before disappearing into the gloom. Claire analyzed the acoustic data, searching for anomalies in the orca's vocalizations. She discovered something unexpected. The orca's calls were atypical, filled with distress and agitation. Orcas communicated using a complex language of clicks and whistles, and the vocalizations Claire recorded were unlike anything she had encountered before. They were haunting, a cry of rage and pain that sent chills down her spine. Determined to understand the cause of the orca's behavior, Claire delved into the region's recent history. She discovered that the local fishing industry had significantly changed in the past year. Overfishing had depleted the stocks of salmon and herring, the primary food sources for orcas. 
In their desperation to maintain their catch, some fishermen resorted to illegal practices, including using explosives to stun the fish, causing immense disruption to the marine ecosystem. Claire hypothesized that the rogue orca's aggression directly responded to these disruptions. The depletion of food sources and the violent methods used by the fishermen had likely traumatized the animals. It was acting out of a primal survival instinct, lashing out at the perceived threat to its existence. With this understanding, Claire knew that stopping the orca would require addressing the root causes of its behavior. She convened a meeting with the fishermen, presenting her findings and urging them to change their practices. The reception was mixed. Some were sympathetic, recognizing their role in the crisis. In contrast, others were skeptical and unwilling to acknowledge the impact of their actions on the marine environment. Claire faced an uphill battle. The fishermen's livelihoods were at stake and the community was divided. She knew persuading them to adopt sustainable practices would take time and effort. She continued her research, documenting the orca's movements and vocalizations and gathering evidence to support her case. In the meantime, the attacks continued. Another boat was found adrift and its crew was missing. The fear in the village intensified and the calls for more drastic measures grew louder. Some demanded that the orca be hunted and killed viewing it as a monster that needed to be eradicated. Claire was determined to prevent such an outcome. She believed that understanding and addressing the underlying causes of the orca's behavior was the only way to resolve the crisis. So she sought allies among environmental organizations and government agencies. The breakthrough came when a group of fishermen, led by a respected elder, agreed to participate in a pilot project. They adopted sustainable practices using less invasive methods and reducing their catch to allow the fish stocks to recover. The rogue orca's behavior began to change. The attacks decreased in frequency, and the animal's vocalizations became less distressed. Claire believed that the orca was responding to the improved conditions, sensing that the threat to its survival was diminishing. Despite these positive developments, tensions remained high. Some factions within the community continued to call for more aggressive action, viewing the orca as an ever-present danger. Claire knew that lasting change would require a fundamental shift in attitudes and practices, which could take years. In time, the fishing community of Kashega began to heal. The fishermen adapted to the new practices, improving their catches as the marine ecosystem recovered. The orca sightings became less frequent, and the animals seemed to have found peace. Mary had always been self-conscious about her weight. As a child, she had been the target of unkind remarks and stares, and those experiences had left her hesitant to engage in activities that drew attention to her body. Vacations, especially those involving swimsuits and beaches, were a particular source of anxiety. Yet here she was in South Africa, having decided it was time to push past her fears. Her family had planned this vacation for months hoping it would be a time for relaxation and adventure. They had chosen a beautiful coastal town known for its stunning beaches and clear waters. It was a perfect opportunity for Mary to try something she had always been curious about, but too afraid to attempt, snorkeling. On a bright morning, the sky was clear and the water was inviting. Mary decided it was time. She felt excitement and trepidation as she put on her snorkeling gear. Her family cheered her on from the beach, encouraging her. The coolness against her skin was a welcome sensation as she waded into the water. She adjusted her mask and took a deep breath before plunging her face into the water. The underwater world was mesmerizing. Schools of colorful fish darted around her and the coral reefs were alive with activity. Mary was amazed by its beauty and tranquility. She swam farther out, captivated by the vibrant marine life. She was so absorbed in the experience that she didn't realize how far she had ventured from the shore. It wasn't until she surfaced to adjust her mask that she noticed how distant the beach had become. Panic started to build, but she forced herself to stay calm. She could swim back, she told herself. She just needed to take her time and not exhaust herself. She took a few deep breaths and put her face back into the water, beginning the journey back to the shore. As she swam, she became aware of a change in the water's rhythm. The fish that had been so abundant were now scarce, and an eerie stillness settled around her. She surfaced again, looking around. 
The beach was still far off, but that wasn't what concerned her the most. It was the shadow she saw moving beneath her. Mary's heart pounded in her chest as she realized what was happening. A great white shark, drawn by her movements, was circling her. Her mind raced, remembering everything she had ever heard about shark encounters. The first rule was not to panic, but that was easier said than done. She knew sudden movements could attract the shark's attention even more. She forced herself to stay still, floating calmly on the surface. Now she could see the shark more clearly, its massive body gliding effortlessly through the water. It was both beautiful and terrifying. She needed to think and devise a plan to fend off the predator. She scanned the water around her for anything she could use as a weapon, but there was nothing. The shark passed beneath her, close enough that she could see the scars on its skin and the cold, predatory gaze in its eyes. She knew she had to act. She remembered reading that sometimes, making yourself appear larger and more threatening could deter a shark. She spread her arms and legs wide, making herself as big as possible in the water. For a moment, it worked. The shark veered off, circling at a distance, but it was far from gone. Mary knew she couldn't maintain this position forever. Her muscles were already starting to ache, and the shore seemed impossibly far away. She needed to move, but she needed to do it without drawing the shark back to her. Slowly, she began to swim again, keeping her movements as smooth and steady as possible. She kept an eye on the shark, watching its every move. It was still circling, still interested. Her mind raced with strategies. She remembered that strong, unexpected sensations often deterred sharks. She could scare it off if she could deliver a solid blow to its sensitive snout or gills. She had nothing to use as a weapon, but she did have her fins. They were sturdy and designed to help her swim efficiently. She could use them to kick if the shark got too close. It wasn't much, but it was something. She swam with purpose now, her eyes constantly scanning for any sign of the shark coming closer. Mary's legs were burning from swimming and holding herself, ready to strike. She was exhausted, but she couldn't stop. The beach was getting closer, but she wasn't safe yet. The shark made another pass, closer still. Mary could feel the water churn as it moved past her. She knew this was it. She had to make her stand. As the shark turned for another approach, she readied herself. It came at her and she kicked out with all her strength, aiming for its snout. The impact was jarring, but it worked. The shark recoiled, startled by the unexpected resistance. Mary didn't wait to see if it would come back. She swam as fast as she could towards the shore, her limbs screaming in protest. She could now hear her family's and other beachgoers' shouts urging her on. The water grew shallower, and she could feel the sand beneath her feet. She stumbled and fell, but got up again, pushing herself forward. The shark had stopped following her, deterred by the shallows and the commotion. Mary made it to the shore, collapsing in the sand her body trembling with exhaustion and relief. She lay there for a moment gasping for breath before she realized her family surrounded her. They helped her up, their faces a mix of concern and admiration. Mary couldn't believe what had just happened. She had faced her greatest fear and survived. In the days that followed, Mary reflected on her experience. She had always seen herself as weak and incapable. Still, she had discovered a strength within herself she never knew existed. She had faced a deadly predator and used her wits and determination to survive. A profound realization changed how she saw herself and her capabilities. The vacation continued, and Mary became more willing to try new things. She went on hikes, explored the coastal towns, and even went snorkeling again, this time in safer, guided environments. The fear was still there, but it no longer controlled her. She had faced the worst and come out stronger. The Caribbean sun beat down on the azure waters as boats worldwide gathered for the annual competitive spearfishing tournament. This event was renowned among spearfishing enthusiasts, drawing participants who sought the thrill of the hunt and the prestige of victory. Among the competitors was a team led by Carlos, a seasoned diver known for his skill and calm demeanor under pressure. Carlos and his team had prepared meticulously for this tournament. They had spent months training, honing their skills, and familiarizing themselves with the local marine life. The tournament rules were straightforward. The team that brought back the largest and most impressive catch within the allotted time would be declared the winner. 
With his vast experience, Carlos knew the waters well and had a strategy in mind. The team suited up and prepared their gear. Each member checked their spear guns, ensuring they were in perfect working order. They reviewed their hand signals and emergency procedures before slipping into the warm, clear water. The ocean enveloped them, its depths teeming with life and possibility. Carlos led the way, descending slowly into the blue abyss. The underwater world was a kaleidoscope of colors and motion, with schools of fish darting in every direction and the coral reef sprawling like an alien landscape. The team spread out, maintaining visual contact while scanning for their quarry. Seconds turned into minutes as they explored the reef, spearing several smaller fish to keep their skills sharp and to build a sense of rhythm. They encountered barracudas, groupers, and even a few sharks. But something else matched the tournament-winning catch criteria. The tension was palpable, but Carlos remained focused, confident their patience would pay off. Carlos saw it during one of these moments of quiet focus. A giant swordfish, more significant than any he had ever encountered, appeared from the depths. Its sleek, powerful body cut through the water with grace and menace. Carlos signaled to his team, pointing out the fish. They regrouped quickly, understanding the gravity of the situation. This was their chance to secure victory, but they needed to approach with caution. The swordfish, however, seemed aware of their presence. Instead of fleeing, it turned and charged toward them with unexpected ferocity. Its long, sharp bill was a formidable weapon, and its aggression caught the team off guard. Carlos barely had time to react as the fish lunged, forcing him to dive to the side to avoid a direct hit. The underwater struggle began in earnest. The swordfish was not just defending itself, it was attacked with uncommon aggression for its species. Carlos and his team had to balance the need to protect themselves to capture the fish. They used their spear guns sparingly, aware that each shot needed to count, and that missing could provoke an even more dangerous response. Carlos closely watched his dive computer, tracking their depth and remaining air. The swordfish made another charge and one of his teammates barely avoided being struck. Carlos knew they couldn't sustain this cat and mouse game much longer. They needed to devise a plan to subdue the fish without putting themselves in further danger. Drawing on his experience, Carlos signaled to his team to try a coordinated approach. They would attempt to tire the swordfish by forcing it to make repeated charges, hoping to exhaust it enough to make a capture feasible. The team positioned themselves strategically, using the reef's terrain to their advantage. They moved in unison, closing the distance to the swordfish. Carlos aimed with his spear gun, targeting a spot just behind the gills where a clean shot would be most effective. He waited for the right moment, his heart pounding in his chest. The swordfish made one last desperate lunge, and Carlos fired. The spear struck true, embedding itself in the fish's side. The swordfish thrashed violently, its powerful body convulsing in an attempt to break free. The team moved quickly to secure the fish and minimize its suffering. They used ropes and additional spears to immobilize it, carefully avoiding its deadly bill. It was a grueling process, but the swordfish's struggles eventually subsided. With the fish subdued, Carlos signaled for the team to begin their ascent. They were mindful of their air supplies, rising slowly to avoid decompression sickness. The ascent felt like an eternity, each meter a reminder of the delicate balance between success and disaster. Breaking the surface, they were greeted by the bright Caribbean sun and the cheers of the tournament officials monitoring their progress. Seeing the giant swordfish hoisted onto their boat was a testament to their skill and determination. It was a catch that would be talked about for years to come. Back on the boat, the reality of their accomplishments began to sink in. The team was exhausted, but the adrenaline still coursed through their veins. They removed their gear and tended to their minor injuries, sharing looks of relief and triumph. Carlos knew this victory was a collective effort, each member playing a crucial role in the success of their mission. The giant swordfish was measured and weighed and it became clear that Carlos and his team had secured the top spot in the tournament. The announcement was met with applause and admiration from the other competitors. The fish was a true marvel, a once-in-a-lifetime catch that showcased the very essence of the sport. The tournament concluded with a celebratory banquet, where Carlos and his team were honored for their achievement. They received their prizes, but more importantly, they earned the respect of their peers. The story of their encounter with the giant swordfish 
spread quickly, adding to the legends of the tournament. For Carlos, the experience reminded him why he loved the sea and the sport of spearfishing. It was a world of beauty and danger where skill and courage were constantly tested. The encounter with the swordfish had been a stark reminder of nature's raw power and the respect it demanded. The vast expanse of the Arctic spread out in a white wilderness, a landscape so untouched and pristine that it seemed otherworldly. Here on a remote island encased in ice and snow, Alex, a dedicated documentary filmmaker, had set up his base camp. His mission was to capture the elusive and intimate moments of a colony of seals during mating season. This endeavor promised rare and breathtaking footage. With his camera gear meticulously checked and survival equipment stowed away, Alex embarked on what he hoped would be a career-defining project. The seals were gathered on a vast stretch of frozen shoreline, their slick bodies contrasting sharply against the snow-covered ground. Few humans had ever witnessed this sight firsthand. The seals were busy with ritualistic displays and vocalizations, oblivious to the biting cold and howling winds that swept across the ice. Alex, bundled in layers of thermal gear, carefully navigated the treacherous terrain, his camera capturing the intricate dance of nature. Days passed in a blur of icy winds and breathtaking scenes. Alex became a silent observer, blending into the landscape, his presence barely noted by the seals. The camera's lens allowed him to see the world from a perspective few ever experienced, capturing the raw beauty and harsh realities of life in the Arctic. He documented the nurturing bond between mothers and their pups, the playful antics of younger seals, and the majestic yet brutal battles between males vying for dominance. One frigid morning as the pale sun barely peeked over the horizon, Alex spotted a massive male seal that seemed to command the attention of the entire colony. This alpha male was an awe-inspiring figure with battle scars etched into his thick hide. Alex knew that getting footage of this dominant seal would be a highlight of his documentary. He approached cautiously, mindful of the animal's territorial nature. Sensing an unfamiliar presence, the alpha male lifted its head and locked eyes with Alex. The filmmaker's heart pounded as he continued to film, inching closer for a better shot. He knew the risks, but was driven by the promise of capturing something extraordinary. Suddenly the seal bellowed, a deep resonant sound that echoed across the ice. It was a warning, clear and unmistakable. Before Alex could react, the massive seal charged, its bulk moving slowly across the frozen ground. Alex's instinct for self-preservation kicked in. He swung his camera, hoping to deter the animal. The seal's attack was relentless, and the camera equipment offered little protection. Alex stumbled, falling hard onto the ice. Pain shot through his leg where the seal's powerful jaws had clamped down, tearing through his thick clothing. Desperation surged through him as he used his tripod to fend off the aggressive seal, each movement a struggle against the searing pain and rising panic. He knew he had to get away to put distance between himself and the enraged animal. With great effort, he scrambled to his feet, using the tripod to keep the seal at bay as he backed away slowly. The alpha male eventually relented, returning to its territory, but the damage was done. Alex's leg throbbed with pain, the cold seeping into his bones through the torn fabric. The journey back to camp was an agonizing test of endurance and willpower. The extreme cold gnawed at him, sapping his strength and clarity. Though designed for the harsh conditions, his survival gear offered little solace against the pain radiating from his leg. Each step was a battle, his breath forming vapor clouds in the frigid air. Navigating the icy landscape was treacherous. The once familiar terrain seemed like a labyrinth, and each snowdrift and ice formation was a potential hazard. Alex relied on his survival skills, honed over years of filming in extreme environments. The sky darkened, the brief Arctic day giving way to a long, frigid night. Alex knew that stopping was not an option. If he paused, the cold would claim him. He pressed on, his mind focused on reaching his camp. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, Alex spotted the outline of his base camp. Relief flooded through him, giving him a final burst of energy. He staggered into the camp, collapsing near his tent. With trembling hands, he unpacked his first aid kit and began treating his wounds. The bite marks were deep and infection was a real risk in the harsh conditions. He cleaned the wounds as best he could, applying antiseptic and bandages. The pain was relentless, 
but Alex knew he couldn't afford to rest. He needed to secure the camp against the cold and ensure he had enough supplies to last until help could arrive. He activated his emergency beacon, a signal that would alert the nearest rescue station to his predicament. The next few days were a blur of pain and cold. Alex rationed his food and water, careful not to overexert himself. As he waited, Alex reflected on the events that had brought him to this point. The attack had been a harsh reminder of the raw power of nature, of the thin line between observer and participant in the wild. He had always known the risks, but experiencing them firsthand was a sobering lesson. Yet despite the pain and fear, he deeply respected the alpha male seal. It had been defending its territory, following instincts honed over millennia of survival in one of the harshest environments on Earth. As Alex's strength waned and hope began to dim on the fifth day, he heard the distant hum of an approaching aircraft. The sound grew louder, cutting through the wind. He staggered out of his tent, waving a brightly colored fabric to signal his location. The rescue team descended their presence, a beacon of hope in the frozen wasteland. They quickly assessed his condition, their faces a mix of concern and determination. Alex was lifted into the helicopter, the cabin's warmth starkly contrasted with the biting cold outside. He looked over the vast Arctic landscape as they flew towards the nearest medical facility. The experience had been harrowing, but he had survived. His footage would tell the story of the seals, their fierce beauty, and the challenges they faced in a changing world. The early morning sun cast long shadows over the Australian outback, a land of stark beauty and hidden dangers. Mark, a seasoned wildlife photographer, had ventured into this remote wilderness with a singular goal, to capture images of the elusive saltwater crocodile. Known for their cunning and power, these ancient reptiles had long fascinated him. His journey took him to the dense mangroves along the northern coast, where the saltwater crocodiles reigned supreme. Mark had spent weeks preparing for this expedition. He studied maps, consulted with local guides, and meticulously checked his equipment. His camera, lenses, and waterproof gear were all in perfect condition. He knew the risks involved. The saltwater crocodile was a formidable predator, capable of swift and deadly attacks. Yet, the allure of capturing their raw power on film was irresistible. He set out at dawn, the air heavy with humidity and the promise of another scorching day. The mangroves were a labyrinth of tangled roots and murky waters, a perfect crocodile habitat. Mark moved cautiously, his senses alert to every sound and movement. The ground beneath his feet was soft and treacherous, but he was used to navigating rugged terrain. Hours passed as he trekked more profoundly into the mangroves, pausing occasionally to capture the vibrant flora and fauna around him. He photographed colorful birds, stealthy reptiles, and the intricate patterns of the mangrove roots. But the saltwater crocodile remained elusive. Determined not to leave empty-handed, Mark pressed on. As he ventured further, the mangroves became denser, the air thicker with the scent of salty water. He knew he was entering prime crocodile territory. His heart raced with a mix of anticipation and caution. Suddenly, he stumbled upon a hidden nest, a cluster of large leathery eggs partially buried in the mud. His pulse quickened. This was a rare find, but he was acutely aware of its danger. He carefully positioned himself to take a few shots of the nest, mindful of his surroundings. The camera clicked softly, capturing the scene. But then, a sound behind him made his blood run cold. A low, guttural growl, unmistakable and terrifying. He turned slowly, his worst fear realized. The mother crocodile was emerging from the water, an enormous creature with scales glistening in the dappled sunlight. Her eyes were fixed on him, filled with a primal rage. Mark knew he had inadvertently provoked her by disturbing the nest. Without hesitation, she lunged at him with astonishing speed. Mark barely had time to react. He bolted, his heart pounding, adrenaline surging through his veins. The chase was on. The dense mangroves offered little room for maneuvering. Mark's knowledge of the terrain became his greatest asset. He darted through the twisted roots and thick foliage, using every ounce of his agility to evade the pursuing predator. The crocodile crashed through the underbrush behind him, her powerful tail and massive jaws cutting a path of destruction. Mark's mind raced as he ran. He needed to find a way to lose the crocodile and put enough distance between them to find safety. 
He remembered a narrow creek nearby, its banks steep and lined with thick vegetation. If he could reach it, he could use the terrain to his advantage. Reaching the creek, Mark plunged into the water, its coolness a shock to his system. He swam quickly, knowing the crocodile was just behind him. The thick vegetation along the creek's banks offered a potential barrier. He used his hands to pull himself along, the water hampering his movements and providing a measure of cover. The crocodile entered the creek with a splash, her massive form slicing through the water quickly. Mark felt a surge of panic but forced himself to stay focused. He swam to the opposite bank, scrambling up the steep incline, mud and roots offering tenuous holds. He glanced back, the crocodile closing in, her jaws snapping inches from his legs. The chase continued with the crocodile's growls, constantly reminding them of the danger. Mark's muscles burned with exhaustion, but he couldn't afford to slow down. He knew the crocodile would tire eventually, her rage giving way to the physical limits of her body. He needed to reach that point before his strength failed him. He spotted a large fallen tree ahead, its trunk forming a natural bridge over a deeper section of the creek. He headed towards it, hoping it would provide a temporary escape route. He climbed onto the trunk, moving quickly across its length. The crocodile reached the tree's base, her eyes never leaving him. She hesitated, the obstacle momentarily stalling her pursuit. Mark used the precious seconds to gain distance. He reached the other side and continued running, the dense vegetation offering a semblance of cover. Mark's mind worked quickly, assessing his options. He spotted a narrow channel leading away from the cover, its entrance partially hidden by thick foliage. It was a gamble, but he had no choice. He darted towards the channel, hoping the crocodile would struggle to follow. The narrow path was treacherous, uneven ground, but offered a potential escape. He squeezed through the foliage, the channel opening up slightly ahead. The crocodile lunged again, but the narrowness of the path hindered her. Mark kept moving, every instinct telling him to flee. The sounds of the crocodile grew fainter, her pursuit slowing. Mark didn't stop until he was sure he had put enough distance between them. He stumbled upon a rocky outcrop, a rare feature in the mangroves. He climbed onto it, using the elevation to survey his surroundings. The crocodile was nowhere in sight. Mark collapsed onto the rocks, his body trembling with exhaustion. He had survived. He lay there momentarily, catching his breath, the enormity of what had happened sinking in. The encounter had been a stark reminder of nature's raw power the thin line between predator and prey. Mark's thoughts turned to his camera, still strapped to his chest. Miraculously, it had survived the chase. He reviewed the images he had captured, the photos of the nest, and the initial moments of the crocodile's attack. They were raw and powerful, a testament to the intensity of the encounter. After resting for a while, Mark knew he needed to find his way back. He checked his compass and oriented himself. The journey back through the mangroves was slow and cautious. Every sound made him wary, every shadow a potential threat. He retraced his steps, the memory of the chase fresh in his mind. Hours later he emerged from the mangroves, the sun hanging low in the sky. His boat was where he had left it, a welcome sight. He climbed aboard, stowing his gear and taking a moment to reflect. The outback had tested him and pushed him to his limits. He had faced one of nature's most formidable predators and lived to tell the tale. The sun rose over the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, casting a golden glow across the waves. A marine research vessel bobbed gently on the water, anchored off the coast of Australia. On board, a team of marine biologists prepared for another day of studying the vibrant coral reefs below. Among them was Rachel an experienced diver and researcher with a deep love for the ocean and its myriad inhabitants. The team had been in the area for several weeks, documenting the health of the coral reefs and the diverse marine life that called it home. Their mission was crucial, as coral reefs worldwide faced increasing threats from climate change, pollution, and overfishing. The data they collected would contribute to conservation efforts to preserve these underwater ecosystems. The divers suited up, checked their equipment, and reviewed their plans for the day. Rachel was assigned to document a particularly vibrant section of the reef, known for its rich biodiversity. She descended into the clear blue water with her camera and underwater notebook, followed by her teammates. The underwater world was a kaleidoscope of colors and movement, 
Schools of fish darted between the coral formations, and sea turtles glided gracefully through the water. Rachel marveled at the beauty around her, capturing images and taking notes on the various species she encountered. Her teammates fanned out, each focused on their specific tasks. As she swam deeper, Rachel's attention was drawn to a crevice in the reef. She noticed a movement that seemed out of place. She saw a rare and deadly sea snake, its slender body coiled among the coral. Rachel knew she had to be cautious, but her scientific curiosity urged her to document this unexpected encounter. She positioned her camera to take a few shots, maintaining a respectful distance. The snake, sensing her presence, began to uncoil. Rachel's pulse quickened. She knew that even the slightest provocation could lead to an attack. She decided it was best to retreat slowly and give the snake space. But as she turned to swim away, she felt a sharp pain in her leg. The snake had struck, its fangs delivering a dose of venom into her calf. Panic surged through her, but she forced herself to stay calm. She signaled to her team, who quickly recognized the gravity of the situation. Her leg began to feel numb and she knew the paralysis would spread quickly. Time was of the essence. The team sprang into action, forming a protective circle around Rachel as they began their ascent to the surface. The journey to the surface was fraught with peril. The reef was a complex labyrinth of coral formations, and the sea snake's presence added an element of danger. Rachel's breathing became labored as the venom took hold and her vision blurred. Her teammates supported her, guiding her through the maze of coral with determined efficiency. As they ascended, the team remained vigilant for other sea snakes. The disturbance in the water could attract more of them and they couldn't afford another bite. Their progress was steady but slow, the weight of urgency pressing on them. Rachel's condition deteriorated with each passing minute, her movements growing weaker. Breaking the surface, the team carefully lifted Rachel onto the deck of the research vessel. The crew had already prepared the anti-venom and medical supplies, anticipating their urgent need. Rachel was laid on a stretcher and the ship's medic quickly administered the anti-venom, praying it hadn't arrived too late. The venom's effects were swift and severe, and Rachel's body convulsed as the anti-venom began to work. The team watched anxiously, hoping for signs of improvement. They knew the next few minutes were critical. Rachel's breathing was shallow and her pulse was weak. Still, the anti-venom started to take effect, slowly counteracting the toxins coursing through her system. With the immediate danger addressed, the team focused on monitoring Rachel's condition. They knew that recovery would take time and that she needed to be evacuated to a medical facility for further treatment. The captain radioed for emergency assistance and arrangements were made for a helicopter to airlift Rachel to the nearest hospital. The sound of the helicopter's rotors grew louder as it approached the vessel and she was transported into the plane. The medic continued to monitor her vital signs, ensuring she remained stable during the flight. The team returned to their research with Rachel on her way to the hospital. The incident had shaken them, but they knew their work was far from over. Their data was vital to understanding and protecting the fragile coral reefs. They resumed their tasks with renewed focus, aware that their efforts contributed to a more significant cause. The following days were tense as they awaited news of Rachel's condition. Updates from the hospital indicated that she was stable and responding well to treatment. The venom had caused significant damage, but the prompt administration of the anti-venom had saved her life. She faced a long recovery, but it was a positive one. 